Namaste viewers. Welcome to Jaipur Dialogue USA, Sunday today. Uh, today we want to talk about the, the real fact that the, there is a rising incessant attack on all things Hindu. Let's, let it be Leicester, Birmingham, Canada, PFI, Wakf Board, which has kind of awakened the, the people. The key question is, that while we get to know on the social media the amount, amount of uh, reaction that is going on, it is good. The awakening is showing up. The question is, and the real question is, twofold. Why is it happening in such a devious way, such a vile way, such a violent way? And will the Hindus be able to sustain the response that is required to be done? Let's talk about it. I have the greatest of pleasure in welcoming Savio Rodriguez, who is also popularly known as Prince Arihan. And uh, the first thing that I will ask him, though I know him for a very, very long time, but never ask this question. Uh, where did you get the name Prince Arihan? What was the inspiration for that, Prince? If I may. Um, ask yes, you may. Um, so I, I do a lot of meditation and a lot of prayer. So whenever I embark on a journey, I normally uh, go into a solitude and I pray over it. And uh, just like when I had my daughters, uh, you know, I had another name chose for them. But when I was in prayer, I was, uh, I got the name Cadence. And that's my elder daughter's name, which, which came to me while praying, as well as Kiana, which is my younger daughter's name. So much the same way, even Goa Chronicle for that matter. So when I was looking for a good name uh, for Twitter and my social media handles, okay. I, I prayed and uh, Arihan came up. Uh, Arihan is a, uh, in, in, in mythology is, uh, is a warrior who fought against evil and he was princely uh, the warrior. So that's the reason why Prince Arihan. It came to me and I didn't even know there was a, there was a mythological person by the name of Arihan and it just came to in prayer. But that is so appropriate because you are a fighter and you, I, are, I, a, I, you are a meditator. These are universal principles. Yes. So my question to you would be and would like to know from this angle that why is this incessant attack happening on Hindus all over the world? It's not longer India. The people who are attacking are no longer shying away from it. It almost appears that this was already in the plan, in their plot, to dismember, dismantle. Now they, we know these words, but now it has gotten open. There is no more, uh, you know, what you call amanki ashav, you know, you know, delusion in the Hindus. Tell us your thoughts on why are we such a threat to world peace? We're not threat to world peace. We are not. That was a question in sarcasm. You know, that was I'm trying we're, to drive. We're, we're not, but we are certainly a threat to uh, economic uh, growth uh, across the world. Now, we have to understand what they saw of India prior to the invasions that happened and what they see India now over the last eight years, which is seeing a very resurgent India. Right, it's not that there was there was no powerful India in the last seventy years. There was, but there was not. There were, wasn't this kind of uh, exuberance or energy or josh, as you would call it, where where India is coming together under a platform that is stronger than emotions. It is a platform uh, which is a love for Bharat, Bharat being the entire aspect of of uh, Bharat, which is not only restricted. The geographical aspect of Bharat, but it's also this. Uh, it also goes to towards and beyond India's geography to other parts where the eth the ethos of Bharat is spreading around the world. So the ethos of Bharat is actually something which is instilled in many people who have the Sanatan Dharma principles in them, and it is the same Sanatan Dharma principle that is leading to the growth of India that you are seeing now. Keeping politics aside which is always uh, whimsical, which is always cynical. The truth is that there is a resurgence of the belief in the Sanatana Dharma uh, values and the Sanatana Dharma ethos, and that is being seen globally. 
and that is what is what is scaring a lot of the uh, religious orders that are normally as you see internationally which is islam and christianity and and that's scaring scaring a lot of people so for us we need to understand one thing is that the sanatan dharma values is not essentially the values of ahimsa as many people would like us to portray it's not ahimsa ahimsa is just one aspect of it which was popularly popularized by mahatma gandhi but it's beyond that ahimsa goes even beyond just accepting you know uh, somebody coming and slapping you on your cheek and giving him another cheek to slap on i think today uh, we have to go beyond ahimsa where some if somebody were to slap me on my cheek i would slap him on both his cheeks turn him around and kick him on his in his rare cheeks that he has that's the india of today because please understand even the catholic church spoke about what was what was called as the just war theory a just war theory that was popularized by the catholic church were reasons that a nation would defend itself defend its identity defend its ethnicity for a purpose and i think today the research in india today the principles of sanatan dharma the the teachings within the bhagavad gita which spoke about defense which spoke about uh, you know ensuring that your culture your cultural ethos is protected that is what is scaring a lot of people across the world that india is fighting for its cultural ethos it's not religious religion is one aspect of it sanatan dharma is more linked to this cultural ethos of this this country and people across so today when you see an uprising happening in uk you see an uprising happening in the us and the the hate speeches against hindus over in in those in those regions you are realizing that maybe the islamists in those countries the hardcore uh, christian uh, evangelicals in those countries are seeing that india sanatan dharma which propagates peace which propagates just war as well which is standing up for your rights is actually penetrating into the psyche of many people and that fear that is why their target is political that is why if you look at the speeches that was happening in uk they are talking about bjp they are talking about rss they are talking about the growth of hindutva i'm i i'm pretty sure nobody understands what hindutva means you know and hindutva is not it's not violence defending yourself is not violence defending your cultural ethos is not violence if the catholic church's theory of just war was accepted for decades then the defense of of the sanatan dharma against the the, the defiling of our cultural ethos should also be accepted and that is exactly where we are standing in right now if you were to ask me in a global geopolitical situation sanatan dharma is the beacon of hope for the world more than christianity and definitely more than islam because islam has suddenly allowed for its radicalism to spread you know across the world and that's going to be dangerous in the long run for everybody if you don't control radicalism that's a wonderful opening statement that you made and i totally agree with you it is impossible for anybody to disagree with what you said because radicalization is the extremist attitudes prevent a dialogue and a debate which has been a very virtue of sanatan principle you dialogue and you debate you indulge in discussion and that's how you arrive at the solution uh you know you are totally right that uh, you know protecting and defending your own culture is dharma is the just cause as you very rightly said so the question then arises that does sanatan dharma pose an existential threat to the religions the way they are practiced today because in my humble opinion i i recognize in my capacity to think that religion as practiced was always based on fear and ignorance of people now the evolution of science and technology as we know it has brought about significant awareness and a very simple example 
thunder, lightning and thunder don't happen because gods are angry right? right tsunami and desert are not given to people because they were punished it's a geographical phenomenon it's a natural phenomenon likewise we now know that men are responsible for the gender determination of a child women are not these are shaking the very fundamentals of the beliefs that once brought people together there is another important part i remember my father bought me encyclopedia britannica when i was studying in high school for me to learn and know what is available today unfortunately entire bible quran bhagavad gita ramayan encyclopedia britannica is right in here we do not need to listen to a mullah priest or a pandit to hear what our texts have to say it's we can do it ourselves and this is bringing about greater realization of practice and preaching and that's the question i have and it'll please tell us more about it that is islam which is unfortunately the most violent they are indulging in most violent practices along with khalistanis against india and hindus are they afraid do they fear greater exposure well sanatan dharma uh, quite naturally is a threat to all existing religions that focus on proselytization because the very principle of sanatan dharma is to accept the god in you and to accept the god around you right so it it puts every aspect or every creation of god on an equal footing so there is no god on the top and no god and no human below everybody is on the same footing all sanatan dharma encourages you to is to find the god within you to right. find the purity within you to find the goodness within you to find the balance within you it's not dependent on a book it's not dependent on uh, on uh, doctrines it's not dependent on uh, habitual practices that become a part of those doctrines that you have to follow what it's dependent on is a simple human truth that you are a human and the other person around you is also a human the creation around you was created with a purpose to support humanity and that's why you have to be good to the creation and uh, around you as well so every act that you are you do are responsible for has an has a op, uh, has an uh, reaction to what you do every action has an equal and opposite reaction to what you do and that's what science teaches us so it's a more it's a more accepting thought process and as we we live in today's day and age with so much of exposure uh, to to things and the world becoming smaller with technology you are able to understand that maybe maybe these uh, doctrines these indoctrinations that have been happening because of religion uh, you know is actually the division that is that the world is seeing if you look at it globally today christianity and islam are fighting all over the world i mean i can say that with authority last year i did a course online course with harvard on religion conflict and peace and in that course itself we studied about 50 cases right. and 50 cases around the world of conflict over religion and which were the most areas of conflict for christianity and islam and in some cases there were one sect of christianity against another sect of christianity in some cases there were one sect of islam against the other sect of islam that's right, right? and that's the sadness the, the sadness is i personally believe and if I, i when once i complete my my thesis the thesis is going to be that religion is the root cause of conflict in this world right it is so sanatan dharma rises above religion it's on the path of spirituality so it's not about whether you believe in the hindu practices or not whether you believe in the hindu gods or not what is important for you to believe more importantly is whether you believe in the goodness and the godliness within you whether you are able to aspire for that within you and able to use that godliness within you that humanness within you to share with your with with the people around you with the nature around you today the world is becoming so cynical so cynical that it won't take us time to forget the humanity within us and we'll start looking at everybody through the religious prism and that is why sanatan dharma is a threat sanatan dharma penetrating to other parts of the world 
Indians taking Sanatan Dharma to other parts of the world with their with their lifestyle, with their way of 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 uh, you know uh, merging with different cultures and not imposing their will on other people is 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 something that's threatening a lot of people. Because if you look at what's happening in other parts of the world and look at India, the proselytization, whether it's Islamic or whether it's from the Christian evangelical sects, what are they doing? They're coming into India and saying, your gods are demons. You know, we don't want uh, people to believe in these demonic gods. They, they mock the faith. They mock the culture. They mock everything. Do you see the, the Indian Sanatan Dharma followers doing that when they go to the U.S.? Do they mock it? No, they don't. So Sanatan Dharma per se, I'm not talking about the fanatics that might be in some aspects of, of, of our, our Hindu beliefs. There are fanatics all over. Yeah. But the larger section of population of faith is about humanity over and above everybody else. And today we've lost that in most cases. Pick up any recent war, even the recent Russia-Ukraine war. What is it about? Why is the Pope talking so vehemently and asking to for prayers for Ukraine? He hasn't said the same about Russia, has he? At one point of time, there were there were stories that were saying that he's probably supporting Russia. Yeah. Right? So yeah. why is he praying for Ukraine now? So the point is, if the Catholic Church itself believes in a concept called just war theory. And you had the Islamists also having a similar theory called jihad. Then why shouldn't it be the prerogative of us to have our own defense mechanism to protect our spiritual beliefs and our cultural beliefs? Why? I'm not saying you should be violent. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not asking us to go offensive. But why can we not defend what is truly ours? Why can't we defend what is our cultural ethos? Today, the world is looking at a light, Vibhuti. They're looking for, a, for, for guidance. Why are they turning to Sanatan Dharma? Because it is non-violent. It is, it is, it is a mechanism of, of reaching out to people in, in a very humane way. It does have a certain aspect of defense, but not violence. Peace is not the absence of, of, uh, of uh, conflict. Peace is the absence of violence in times of conflict. That's what Wolfgang Galting said. Right? The yep. point I'm trying to tell you is today the threat that comes from Sanatan Dharma, from the Hindus, is that it's a civilizational threat that the religion is finding because Sanatan Dharma is about spirituality and not religion. It is, it is so gratifying and so wonderful to hear your enlightened thoughts on it. And I definitely hope that this particular momentum in this era of technology and science, where news travels faster than the speed of lightning, if I may use that metaphor, it's very important. And I think people have an automatic defense mechanism. So religion as it has been practiced, uh, that's the particular phrase I use, as practiced. I'm not saying X, Y, Z about any religion. I will not deprecate anybody's way of life. But you brought in a very fundamental point about proselytization. That is the root, you know, religion and proselytization, proselytization as a tool is the root cause of all conflicts. And as I see the pictures of the conversion mela that happens in India, I have shared it with some of my Christian friends here. I said, do you approve of that? I mean, we know there are billions of dollars committed to convert India to Christianity. But Pope is in the wheelchair. But those people will not do anything for the Pope. But they do this miracle drama, which is 100% staged. It looks staged, cooked up, manipulated, is allowed in the name of freedom of religion. And that brings me to a very important point. And I, which is what I always ask, is conversion of people to X faith or Y faith a sin against God's original intent? God is the ultimate magician. He made Savio Savio. He made Vibhuti Vibhuti. He could have made you either or, but he Correct. didn't.
So is we must debate on this issue that, or to talk about this issue, is conversion as a tool a sin against God's original intent? You know, uh, what I what I would like to say very vehemently yeah. is that conversion to find a better God is it itself, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the more non-brutal word would be a joke. Okay? But if an adult chooses to convert, I don't oppose that. Yeah. But what I oppose is forced conversion, coercive conversion, yeah. and conversion based on lies. Okay? Right. Conversion based on demonizing another religion. Right? Today, matters of faith are personal, matters of faith are within a family, and matters of faith are within a community. You cannot be overbearing on another community or another, another individual based on, on what you consider to be your understanding of that person's religion or not. Which means, for example, even in this case, like there were many people mocking the Pope's illness, saying that why don't miracle workers heal the Pope? Well, let's be honest, the, the miracle workers don't belong to the Catholic Church at all. The evangelical evangelists are the ones who do these, the believers are the ones who do these miracle crusades. The Pope, for whatever weakness he has in terms of the, uh, the management of the Vatican, at the end of the day is, a, is an old person with a health issue. And as humans, I would look at him irrespective of how much anger I might have on certain issues with him or certain disagreements I might have with him, I will still want the best for him in the best possible way. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So yeah. mocking him is not, not my idea of anything and I don't approve of people mocking him. I wouldn't approve of anybody right. mocking and a common man for that matter, you right. know, who's ill. Right? The point is, where do we stand today? Today, the country needs to understand and these people who are coming in trying to convert people, what are they doing? What are they converting for? What is the objective of that conversion? The objective of that conversion is numbers. The objective of that conversion is money. The objective of the conversion is camouflage as a better life. Right? Now, why has this been going on for so long? It's not something that's new. Conversions were not something that happened now. Conversions were happening in, in Goa way past 500, 600 years ago. The Jesuits were not the first people to come into Goa. It was the Franciscans, the Dominicans that came before. Right? The point I'm trying to make is that when uh, Jesus sent his disciples to different parts of the world, which was many years, many decades ago, that's when conversion supposedly started, according to some people. But they were not conversions. They were preaching about what, what, the, what the good news was all about. Many years later, what it turned out to be, when it became an organized setup, it turned out to be capturing people. It, became, it turned out to be being about the business of it. Today, the Vatican, in fact, the article I just did and sent it to you, what was the Vatican about? The Vatican is valued at, at over 4 billion euros. And that's only the Vatican operations. I've not even taken the Vatican bank operation. I've not taken the Vatican uh, archives. How much is the value of the things over there, the artifacts over there? Right? So I'm only taking things that were donations given, which was a document that the Vatican brought out itself. It, they, they made public in 2019. Right? So all these organizations, whether it's the Catholic Church, whether it's the believers, whether it's the evangelicals, whether it's the Jehovah Witness, you know, the point is it turned out to be operational aspects of the business, which is why today when Pope Francis said in his tweet that the rich man's name is not mentioned and the Lazarus is mentioned, referring to the Gospel of Luke, you know, 16, 19 to 31, chapter 16, 19 to 31 verse, he was talking about how the poor man needs, you know, his connect to God gives him that importance. And the rich man is in hell. That's really what the parable was all about. So in the Vatican's, if you look at what was exposed in 2019, the Vatican itself, a report that Wall Street Journal carried and, and another uh, Italian newspaper that did the investigation was that 
a li- little over 10% of the contributions that they got from globally actually went into charitable causes, less than 10%. So the remaining 90%, which were, which were donation taken for charitable causes, went into administration of the Vatican operations globally and into reducing its, its financial deficit. So is that a rich Vatican looking after the poor Lazarus? The answer is no. So these are organizations, these are institutions, but they are not the the representative of the faith of the people. You see, a man can man or a woman can believe in a stone and it turns him into a better person or her into a better person, then that could be God for him. How does that matter? What matters at the end of the day is how are you relating with your religious belief, with your spiritual belief, with the other person. And that is where Sanatan Dharma takes precedence. I'll give you a classic example. And I've been having it ever since I joined the BJP. You know, somehow the people in my own constituency in some parts of Goa just don't like the fact that I'm within in the BJP. They never like the fact that I expose the sexual abuse crimes as well. So it's it's all a fallout of the entire thing. The point is this. I wanted to donate uh, to the to the poor section in my constituency, and I went to one of the Christian organizations that represents the constituency, and I said it's my birthday, so I wanted to feed a set of people who are poor, and you know, tell me how to do it. Uh, is there a way? Do I have to donate? Do I have to bring the food? How do I do it? And it's a very popular uh, church organization. The lady who represents that church organization tells me, Savio, I'm, we are sorry, but uh, we can't uh, let you do this because you're a BJP politician. I said, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm, uh, what am I forgetting? It's my birthday. My NGO wants to come and do something. No, but you're a BJP politician. So we do not want you to influence people in the community through this uh, acts that you want to do. So I said, OK, don't worry. If if the church organizations in the Valem constituency like yours does not want me to help the poor there, I will go to the Hindu uh, organizations over there who have poor uh, people, and I will help them because my purpose is to help somebody. Whether it was a religion or not, it was immaterial. My teammate said, there is this organization that belongs to the church. They do this. I reached out to support you. You think I'm a BJP person and you don't want my support? That's your problem. That's not mine. Right, so that is how, how uh, deep rootedly insane. It's absolutely insane. I'll give you another example. Happened four days ago. We had gone to each school, uh, and and uh, in in the Valem constituency again, uh, to give the children seed balls to plant. Okay. Uh, the first school, Saint Rock. I had a brilliant experience with uh, with uh, the father and the, the children. We taught them what the seed balls was, how we made it, everything. Then we went to another school. I won't name it. It was in the vicinity. So uh, I always wear my BJP T-shirt wherever I go because that's my my branding. Transforming Valem is my brand, right? So I went there and we started, uh, the kids were happy, we spoke, we started explaining to them and then we put the seed balls and all. And then this headmistress comes and says, you know, you have you can't wear the t-shirt and all that. This We don't want BJP branding in the school. We are neutral. You know, you're, and I said, okay, ma'am, do you want me to take off my t-shirt here? That would be more embarrassing to you and your students. You know, so I'm sorry <laughs> if it's, it's uh, it might seem a little odd, but yes, I apologize if, if, we wore the T-shirt, but I wear it all the time. I'll go into church also and I'll wear a T-shirt like that. So I don't have a problem. Anyway, so we neutralized the situation. And then she made this this very odd statement to this youth girl who had actually set up this particular seed ball plantation. And she tells this youth girl, I never knew you were not a Christian, a Catholic. If you were, I would have not allowed this program to happen there. Now I know you're a Hindu and you guys want to saffronize everything over here. So I went back to the lady and I said, ma'am, I don't know what you understand. But BJP is here to stay. More importantly, our intent is pure. Our intent is good. If you don't see it, that's your problem, ma'am. It's not our problem. 
but i apologize if there was a miscommunication from my youth wing and it will not be done again next time i will come with proper communication to you and that's how it left so again what was it it was deep rooted insanity hate what i saw was hate and when i see hate it disturbs me how can people who profess religion of peace religion of love religion of compassion be so hateful to another person the, the the girl was a youth you tell her you are not allowed inside my school because she's a hindu is that what you're teaching those students that is your hate i hate bjp so because you hate bjp you hate hindus you hate the very aspect of humanity is that what a role of a teacher is what imagine what she is teaching those kids imagine the indoctrination happening in in catholic schools against hindus and against the bjp such is the polarization happening around the world it's not only in india it's happening all over the people who are rising up in the other countries against the hindus is why they are using bjp and rss as the forefront but the hate is against the spiritual aspects that sanatan dharma actually professes and preaches and lives that's the hate it's a civilizational hate it's a hate that brought them here into this country in the into our uh, continent in the first place they came to change us they came to change us tribals into westerners that is why they came in the first place so today this hate whether it's islamic whether it's christian hate and when people say oh my god christians are in danger minorities are in danger i i i argue and i argue all the time if you looked at the the cases in 2021 there were 348 cases of conflict that the church uh, the christians had reported about and this was by a christian organization they did their own report what is the population of the christians in india 3.12 crores in 2021 348 cases of conflict and you term india as being dangerous for christians that means the remaining 3.12 crore christians are in danger for that matter if you go by the say by a report done on on us in 2021 951 cases of uh, conflict were there amongst the jews does that make us uh, the joe biden the next hitler why is in the us writing about that why is the us writing about indians being in danger minorities being in danger and the jews in danger in the, in the us that's the problem the problem is a civilizational problem the problem is the wanting to crush the beliefs of sanatan dharma and they will lose they will lose because sons of bharat mother like sabio will stand up because my christian faith doesn't teach me to hate somebody <coughs> I, that's I, the problem i i i really admire and applaud you for your such strong rendition of your belief which is so so heartening because you talked about a couple of things here the media does its own evil act unfortunately we are also part of the media but we are trying to expose the truth we are trying to share the truth with the rest of the world but here is an issue you know that how different standards are applied you know as you said hate i i hate the word hate it is a very interesting thing hate has no moral or ethical justification to it none whatsoever because hate is the one which makes you evil makes you Absolutely. a devil and if 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 we are not able to control that urge of devilishness in us we become evil ourselves and that's what is important for us to talk about and this is where the standards become different so if you protest against a practice in front of a mosque or a church you are immediately branded islamophobia or hating christianity but if you do it in in front of a hindu temple it's okay <laughs> it's not because you are against the you know the idol worshipers and things like that you know and i i definitely quote here robert spencer saying 
this is a time for no time for gandhi style appeasement and pandering and cowardice this is the one element which the hindu uprising is happening right now the social media is a buzz the number of hindus who have become active to protect and defend their own rights because as i said in the opening statement now things are not hidden anymore whether it's a khalistani or extreme islamist agenda against hindu the few people are driving that entire thing is of creating a bigger awareness so in the political system it appears you talked about bjp and rss modi and R- rss branding of hindus as evil it is religion driven but how do indians confront that you know removing modi is as a famous uh, caption goes modi's picture saying that they are not after me they are after you can't be more true that he is just an instrument he is just a voice and he has created that awareness not everything he has done is golden not everything has turned golden but the man has definitely brought as i use the sanskrit phrase ki hinduon ke mukhar bindu khul gaye hain now we are using technology our mouths have opened that i think is the biggest contribution if i were ever to rate mr modi or if anybody was to ask me to rate he has opened up brought in pride True. and he talks about sanatan he's opening a statement i'll never forget the constitution is my book if there was a book tell us what drives such vicious anti anti modi hate and i call it a hate the people have against him you what have done wrong vibhuti when i joined the bjp i was always known to be a supporter of uh, the bjp because of my my mentor mans mr parikar and of course mr modi himself you know the amount of viciousness i faced from relatives uh, within my family as in my wife's family uh, not so much my family because they know i'm a difficult person to to deal with uh and uh, but the hate hate to such an extent viputi that they were telling my wife that she should divorce me and the family would look after her because i joined the bjp can you imagine that mortal and i have been married for uh, been together for 24 years married for uh, 19 years together all right and uh, and they were actually uh, trying to impress upon her just because i joined the bjp to leave me that is hate there's no other way to look at it by nature i'm a very peaceful person you know very calm very composed not known to uh, to losing my cool but the problem with hate is that it needs to be it needs to be dealt with it cannot be overlooked because it becomes a habit it becomes a habit to mocking anything to do with sanatan dharma it becomes a habit to mock hindus it becomes a habit to make fun of bharat mata it becomes a habit to make fun of everything that relates to our cultural ethos or to create some uh, modification to that cultural aspect in in a very very non sanatan dharma way okay i'm not saying that people should follow sanatan dharma that's not what i'm saying sanatan dharma <coughs> is not something that you it just happens it's something that you grow into a belief system okay and that is what people are not understanding religion is something that that is is taught to you it's something that you could experience but your relationship with 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 the entity called god is a personal relationship now the irony of the religions that that we are seeing in today's world is that each religion is trying to be the way to god and here's the here's the funny aspect of it if god created all of us then how could god himself be selective on who has the right the passage or the right to heaven or hell it's like me having two daughters right can i take um can i choose one to live and the other to die 
I cannot, no. My love has to be unconditional. So the God, so God who's the creator of all humanity and of all creation, how can he tell us or tell us to the religion or whoever his, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a him or a she, that also we don't know. But how can God tell us that we should hate another person because his beliefs are different? That's not God. That's a religion. That's not spirituality. The moment hate enters into religion, spirituality flies away. Savio, you can't be more right because I say this very openly. God created life and he created life sustaining elements for us. The sun, the water, air. These are life sustaining forces. And that is universal for everyone. It is the angle of the sun that changes the color the skin of people, kind of country they live in. Sun Correct. doesn't discriminate between any of the any any of the individuals and people. And therefore, Correct. I believe that religion was created by human beings. Some smart aleck decided to control people around them and they propagated that thought, I am the messenger of God. Whereas God forgot that God never appointed anybody a messenger. of. There is a very ideological conflict here because believers, you know, this is a very strong thing. We are discussing this as aware people who, who you know, we want to understand this. Why this hate? Why this anger? Why my way or highway? You know, where does that come from? And how did religion grab people with such vicious ways that they do not look at others as a potential human being as themselves. This is a very critical question and the science and technology is changing that now. That's why we have so many ex-Muslims, so many people leaving Christianity, so many Hindus practicing whatever they are. And I, as I often say this, it doesn't matter. Like this is my father's teaching to me. It doesn't matter how many times you pray, but what you do that defines you eventually. So why have we forgotten the basic elemental human aspects of life and why are we so committed to committed is a positive word how are we so madly driven to accept something that is seemingly inappropriate you know one of uh, that's why like i said i am i'm a person who believes in humanity more than anything else right. okay i was born into a christian faith there are certain aspects of the the Bible that I don't agree with. Uh, in my un, my limited understanding, I don't claim to be a man with a lot of wisdom, but I'm a simple man who understands simple things. The simple, the, my entire life has been under the two commandments that Jesus has given. One was love God with all your heart and with all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else I ignore. I only look at these two aspects of what he said. I'm not saying everything that's come out of the Bible is right. For all you know, there are conflicting uh, uh, statements within the Bible itself that raises a lot of questions. And the church finds the utilization of certain aspects of the Bible to justify its acts. Like the just war theory is one of the theories that they had used and they used biblical terminology to justify it. But what does it mean to love God? In all fairness, what does that mean? Has anybody seen God? So how do you understand what God is, if not through the manifestations of God, if not through the creation of God? So what is the first manifestation of manifestation of God that you come across? Are your parents? Right? Yep. Show me which country and which ethos, cultural ethos, has made parents so important, if not Bharat. Do you see the respect that parents have in the Western world when compared to the respect Bharat, the children of Bharat uh, give their parents with touching of the feet and taking blessings? Have you seen that happen in the Western world? It's very little. Right? Yep. Why is that? Because you, know, you don't understand that the manifestation of God is not a statue somewhere. It is not the priest giving you a homily. 
It is the people who are in front of you. So your first manifestation of God is your parents. Your second manifestation of your God are your, your relatives in front of you. Your sister, your brother, and your friends around you. The manifestation of God is the animals around you. The nature around you. When religion started to, to become into an organized setup and realized that in order for them to, to grow, they needed people, just like any brand, like any product, right? Religion became a product. The whole 800 years after Jesus' death, you had the formation of the Catholic Church, right? And that is how the organized religion of the Catholic Church happened. Before that, there were Gnostic Christians traveling around the world, preaching about what Jesus spoke about. Then you come to the second pa part of it, which is love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the first aspect is you have to love yourself in order to love your neighbor, which means you have to look within and accept yourself for the truth of what you are. Whether you were born uh, poor, whether you were born rich, there is a purpose to your life. Rich, Being rich or poor doesn't define your status in society. No, that is, that is a Western creation. What is, what is important is that, hey, today I'm born in this space. What is my dharma at that point of time? What am I supposed to do if I'm a janitor? Can I do that work with that honesty that I bring to it? If I'm a rich businessman, can I can I use my wealth to multiply uh, happiness across the world? That is Sanatana Dharma. So eventually, people will wake up, and I, I see that happening. People will go beyond religion and move to the realm of spirituality because... In the end, what does, what does the young world want? It does not want boring lectures. It's, it's, it's a priest pontificating on the virtues of marriage when he's not married. You know, a priest lecturing and pontificating on the virtues of marriage doesn't know the strains of a marriage. There might be a lot of love in marriage, but the strains of the marriage are different. Right? Yep. At the end of the day, the most important thing for us is to look at humanity. And that's why I'm a firm believer of humanity. And you know what the world is scared about. The world is scared about is the principles of Sanatana Dharma actually striking at the heart of every individual in this world to make them realize that at the end of the day, the pursuit to God or the idea of God is finding the goodness within you and around you. <laughs> so well said. You know, you one thing I wanted to spend the remaining time that we have on two elements. One is how does one contest it? How does one arise? And how does one defend, protect and defend your own thing? And I will take a very short time to explain, talk about, you talked about touching feet, parents. Yes. That's a very important lesson that our belief system instills in us, touching feet of parents as the manifestation of creation and dharma, our own existence. So this was a question I was asked in one of the forums, that you have such oppressive practices of touching one's feet. So I told that group of people that it is not touching feet in subservience or slavery. It is what you Western people call about keeping your back. You know, people in America all, often talk about, go ahead, I got your back. So when you know, children touch their parents' feet and parents bless them, it is a message that I got your back because you are exposing your back at that time. And I had a very yeah. nice response to that. They said, oh my God. Oh, that's what it means? I said, yes, that's what it means. The parents bless the child because children become very successful in life but they must always be humble to the fact that but for the parents they won't be there and that's the, that is the existential thing that is very important and that parents have only one wish 
and that wish is that their child does well, is protected, Correct. and the parents are the ultimate source of protection for the children. Now I want to, this is, this, this is very important for us Hindus and Sanatanis to know the beautiful way our practices are established. Sanskar has no English translation to the word. It is the practice you established in your interpersonal dealings, as you said very correctly, getting to know other person and love him. That's you establish a sanskar or a practice. But now I want to come to you in the remaining 10 minutes. I want to talk about how does one go about it? Because what is happening is that we Hindus have been told that you are the seekers. And since we are the seekers, we have no organized method of seeking each one to itself. As in Bengali, they say, the famous poem, <coughs> a famous <coughs> <laughs> you have heard about that, to walk alone. The point of the matter is, how does this organized setup happen? Because you can't fight individually. And that's what I notice. Particularly the explain, uh, particularly the fact that Islamic people, Sartan Se Juda, is individually hitting at. They spread the Urdu word, nice Urdu word called dashat, fright. That one Nupur Sharma, one X, one Y, and the rest of the people are get frightened because life matters. They all want to protect themselves. But how will this organized movement happen against the atrocities that have happened in Leicester, in Birmingham, the, the, the attacks in India from the Islamists, the extremists, terrorists, and the conversion machine, heaven and hell. There are so many issues to talk about. We can't talk about in an hour. But we need to continue the dialogue because education must happen. And that particular thing, we must take advantage <clears throat> of technology to spread the message. So, if you so tell one of, how one of the sustain or the so-called quote unquote global pressure will lead to our giving in, succumbing to it. But that has been the Hindu practice, Sanatan practice. Ten gundas. No, I don't agree. Yes, exactly. I don't. I don't. I don't, I, I don't, I I don't agree. Make that statement to provoke you to everybody <laughs> else, but that's not the history. Because all the gods and goddesses in Hindu belief have Shastra and Shastra together. Correct. That's what it's, I mean. it's about Shastra and Shastra, right? Yes. But more importantly, the solution to the conflicts that are arising in uh, that the Sanatana Dharma followers face can be only solved by the Sanatana Dharma followers themselves. For That's one. Right. Okay. Uh, the source of learning for Hindus and Sanatana Dharma followers was temples. Knowledge actually moved from one lesson to another. So that's why we had very few texts. And a lot of conversational uh, knowledge was passed on. You know, uh, When we were invaded, uh, a lot of our temples were destroyed. And a lot of our temples uh, you know, were... were uh, uh, dilapidated post that. What we need to do is we have to ensure that each place, each ward in India that has Hindu followers and beliefs actually has a temple that becomes the source of knowledge of what Sanatana Dharma is all about. The problem why people adapt to Western thought processes and some of our youth are uh, going in that direction is because there's nobody there to teach them on the beauty of our Sanatana Dharma, right? So the first step, I think, is not education. is to is to inspire uh, a lot. A lot of people, like I remember, with one very very strong Hindu organization that normally opted for a little bit of violence in their approach to spreading their message of Sanatana Dharma. I had a disagreement with that gentleman and I said, listen, if you ever come to Goa, I'll be the first person to whip you. If you bring this kind of, uh, of uh, ideo ideologies into Goa, you don't have to make a person perspire. You've got to get them to be inspired. The power of India lies with our youth. The power of Sanatan Dharma lies within the young, young India. And this young India is not within the geographical aspect of India but have spread across the world. It is that power that we have to teach our Sanatan Dharma ethos and values to. And that can only happen when that teaching starts at a, at a home level or it moves and progresses 
to a societal level, which is two temples in India society, where people who are learned can actually explain. It's not not so much about the the doctrinal aspect of it or or the continuous aspect of it that I have to do this and like go to church on Sunday and all that. No. But it's about understanding what is the what is the beauty of the Sanatana Dharma, what's the culture behind it? Why do we keep a tulsi in our house? Why do we do things on certain days? What is a scientific attachment to it? Because it's not it's not hearsay. Everything that the the Vedas teach us and the other books teach us is about is a it's about a scientific explanation to it. There's no other way I can explain it. There's always a science behind it. Right. You may not agree with the science, but there is a science and there's a logic. You see, it's like it's like somebody coming and saying that, you know, uh, we have to sacrifice an innocent lamb so that we atone for our sins. Right? And I find that absurd because I, I, I tend to want to ask God then, why should that innocent person bear or that innocent animal bear the the brunt of the sins committed by the other person right so today yeah. if a person kills somebody and then he goes and he says okay i'm going to sacrifice a lamb or a goat how do you atone for your sins that way by by killing another innocent man and an innocent animal sorry so i don't believe in the concept of retribution by sacrifice Sacrifice of somebody else. You you must make the sacrifice, right? You are the one who sinned. So the sacrifice should be yours. Savio, you have touched upon aspects which are very close to my family experience. By the way, my, my, when my two brothers were going to have the sacred threat ceremony in Pune, that was, uh, my uncle came and we talked about making a goat sacrifice, okay? My father refused. My father told my his elder brother, my uncle, that no, I'm not going to do a goat sacrifice. My uncle threatened him. If you don't do it, there will be it will be a sin and you will be punished. And my father argued with him. I was there, that's why I remember that. He said, No, there has to be an alternate. We are a practice yeah. where there is an alternate. To alternate, my uncle suggested that you have to do one lakh mantra, which would take about a year plus to do to do to have absolution. And my father chose that. And that's where I say that we have solutions to every crisis that we face of Correct. decision and choice. But last minute, I wanted to talk about a very significant element. You talked about temples as well. And uh, you know how the superimposition of certain faith on our temples defies all logic. What is, what is, what is angering a whole lot of Hindus is that this is a law gets vitiated and violated to prove a point. It's a bleeding obvious evidence that the sure. mosque structure exists over a temple. But we have to fight the legal battle to win back what, our, what was our own, which was imposed by somebody else. Where is the sagacity of the communities? Okay, yes, we destroyed your temple. Here it is back to you. Where is the sagacity? Where is the wisdom where is the you know, element of sacrifice coming in and the hindus are i think justifiably angered with the current government for not converting or allowing the temples to convert back or freedom of temples sorry not convert but to make hindu temples free from governmental control although you and i both know the temples are a source of funds for the government to do whatever they do but how where does well, i i hope and i hope in, in fairness and equality that our constitution speaks about, that the Hindu temples are free from government control. I yes. personally believe it should because no church is under government control, no mosque is under government control. And in the spirit of the equality that we talk about in the constitution of India, then the Hindu temple should not be governed by the, by the, by the government. The monies, everything must be run by the temple trusts or the temples themselves, just like they do it with the church and the mosque. But the, for that, see, the most important thing is, is we have to come together to believe that there is a civilizational crisis that we are facing. And we are, we are awakening to 
to fight the civilizational crisis. It's not restricted to the geography of India. It is, you're seeing it spread across different parts of the world, targeting India. And the only reason is because India is, is resurging up again. India is, is, is being noticed to being a, a place where people are coming together. <coughs> In order to break that, they have to create a divide. And remember, India has always been divided on religious grounds. There's nothing more potent than uh, than a religious divide, more than the caste divide in India. So they will hit at religion all the time. So my my personal opinion is that us as Indians, irrespective of our religion, is to see the humanity that exists in us before we see the religion. And after we see the humanity, see the Indian in us. Because that's the second most important aspect. Right. And after all that, you can go and look at your religion and actually understand what it's trying to tell you. Because if your religion tells you to hate another person, it's time you change your God. Very well said. Thank you very much. Very, very enlightening, invigorating conversation today, Savio, with you. And okay. I hope uh, people will watch more of it. We will, let's share it on our platform. And this is not the end of conversation. This is just the beginning. Correct. Education. We have been doing it at Jaipur Dialogue for a very long time. You know, yes. our subscribers love us as a university, <laughs> in the Jaipur Dialogue University. So education is spreading. People are getting to know more. So you know, thank you very much for coming today, viewers. Really appreciate your listening. Like, subscribe, support our channels every which way you can. And uh, you know, it is important. The last point which I wanted to make is. How are we going to sustain this? And that sustaining will come about in both individual and collective capacity. Because as Savio said very correctly, we need to learn ourselves why we touch feet of elders. When we allow a practice to become that we bend and bend in front of a politician, he's not keeping your back. We are then we are bending in submission. It's a very sacred concept, touching the feet. It's not to be abused. So we have to uphold our traditions, our sanskar, and we have to spread the word around the world. But remember one thing, the attack on Hindus all over the world defies logic. Correct. Because we are the most peaceful immigrant community anywhere in the world. We are not a law and order problem in any country of the world, barring, you know, sparring incidents of white collar crime. But we are not a law and order problem anywhere. This is a message we have to tell the lawmakers in countries that we live. And that's the important part, that we must act in our individual capacity. Do not expect government to get to do things for you all the time. They have enough things to do. They have their own priorities, political, social compulsions. But we need to be alert, awake, and I invoke Swami Vivekananda's three words, three A's, aware, become awake, Become aware and assert yourself, to which I always add my fourth A, act. Because if you do not act after knowing what you do, then we are abdicating our responsibility. And that we have to collectively do. Thank you very much for joining today. I just wanted to say for programming reasons that next week onwards, we may shift our timing from Sunday to Thursday or some other day because of a variety of reasons. So be aware. Look forward to the announcement. And we'll get back to you. Savio, onward march with your forward fight. And as we say in our work, always uh, forward march, even though not in a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Namaste. Thank Satya you. Me.